For our final session, um, as I said in the introduction, we're, we're very lucky to have one of the UK's leading authorities on business continuity actually working in the patch. And um, I kind of sense this might be the first time, hopefully not too many, but several times that we kind of use Derek in this context if he's willing, because um, I've been through this presentation with him and I found it absolutely fascinating, and I also found it fascinating visiting Derek <laughs> in a huge room full of about a thousand computers all sitting waiting for you know a disaster we hope will never never happen um, in in Bankside. But so over to Derek. Okay, my name's Derek Mason. Um, I've been in the business of business continuity for about 14 years now, and before that it was an IT background. Um, some of the lessons tonight should apply to all sizes of businesses. Um, bear with me if I start talking about departments and departments and more departments. Um, but if you've got any questions, please ask as we go through. And I might have one or two questions for you as well. And can I just start by saying, can I have a show of hands as to who's got a mature business continuity plan? Okay, that's probably about right, about 50% on average of businesses have, have plans. The finance areas have, you know, 78 percent have, have plans. Okay, just to kick off, um, we need plans for lots of buildings, lots of staff, that's a computer, lots of systems. And we've heard earlier that we can have major incidents, we can have computers stolen, so you know, that's an obvious one. Lots of staff, pandemic flu's on the horizon, that could happen. Anybody tell me what that represents? Loss of, loss of suppliers, or the people you outsource your work to, or your critical suppliers. They must have plans the same as you must have. If you're outsourced, you can't just forget about the responsibility for con continuity. They must have plans as well. Okay, can we just go through this? A simple scenario. What would you do if 8.45, Friday morning, a major fire takes hold in your location following an explosion. Everyone has been evacuated. There are casualties and trauma. It's now nine o'clock, cold and raining. The fire assembly area is crowded. All the local <coughs> buildings have been evacuated. The police believe there'll be further explosions. They're now clear in the immediate area. They're like creating a 400 metre radius for a police cordon. Those arriving for work are being stopped 400 metres away. Your workplace has been totally destroyed. The mobile network has become overloaded and has been shut down to the public. So you know, bear this scenario in mind. You lost your building, you can't communicate with staff, and they're scattered 400 metres around your building. How do you recover your business? from that viewpoint. Bear that in mind. Okay, lessons <coughs> from disasters in HSBC, or Midland Bank as we were before that. Um, 1992, we had the St. Mary's Axe Bomb. That's where the Green Gherkin now uh, sits. Um, we had a head office damaged by that. In 1993, we had the Bishopsgate Bomb. HSBC were in a 22-story building we occupied about half of it. We did not return to that building. Um, 1996, the Manchester bomb. Some of our branches were knocked out in that. Same year, we had the Docklands bomb. Um, I think this is where the um, IRA were trying to um, place a bomb in Canary Wharf. Because of security, they chose a weaker area, just outside Canary Wharf. Um, we had a building next door, 12 storeys. We never reoccupied that building again. This is where things changed. Up to that point, these are IRA bombs, and they weren't out to kill people. They were nice enough to give us a warning, and most of these explosions happened out of hours. Twin Towers, the terrorists are out to kill people. In that uh, explosion, um, we lost the branch. It wasn't a major impact on our group, apart from the infrastructure, the finance infrastructure that was affected, but we only lost the branch. Um, 
In 2003, um, we had a bomb in Turkey. They, they drove a car or a truck into one of our buildings. Fortunately, we had some bollards outside and it didn't get right into the building, but some of our staff were killed. Short memories, what happened in 2005? 7-7. Seven, 7-7, seven. Seven, seven. what else happened in 2005? The end, Spain. say? Spain. The Buntsfield Old Depot explosion, yeah. Hemel Hempstead. Yeah. Okay, we've all got short memories. There's a whole list of things there. These are big ones. There's lots more in there. Um, and again, poor HSBC, or poor me, I got a call at half past seven on the Sunday morning, I was still in bed. Um, there's been a big explosion up the road to where you live, Derek. Well, <laughs> I didn't hear it, actually. <laughs> I think I had a heavy night the night before. Um, my mother heard it 20 miles away, and I thought she was kidding me when she ran up and said, are you okay, Derek? There's been an explosion near St. Albans. Um, but we had a building within about half a mile of that. We have 800 people working there. It's a call centre plus our help desk for HR and they were out of action for a week. The building was damaged. Um, I've got a few photos now. Now, I've purposely chosen some photos taken in the UK. I haven't chosen 9-11, haven't chosen the Turkey bomb. We see enough of that on television. That was Bishopsgate, and you can see their damage all the way up to the top. Fortunately, that was a Saturday morning. We had about 40 or 50 people in that building at the time. We did not evacuate. We evacuated, internal evacuation. We went down to the basement, the, the truck went off, it exploded, and we suffered a few minor injuries. If we'd gone outside into the street, there would have been fatalities. Um, that's some pictures of the Manchester bomb, that's the truck, that's the explosion, and that's the scale of damage around the area afterwards. Um, the Bishopsgate bomb, I can remember walking for 10 minutes along Bishopsgate and seeing the scale of destruction for 10 minutes walk along Bishopsgate. <coughs> That's the Docklands bomb. Um, that, was, that was our building. You can see why we didn't go back into it. Um, up here is the DLR. Uh, the, bomb was, the, the truck was parked underneath the DLR and the explosion went sideways, not upwards. Unfortunately, two people in the news agency's side were killed. And that's a, a picture of our offices in Hemel Hempstead. Yeah, infrastructure damage only, but enough to keep us out of the building for a good week. Ceiling tiles come down, windows were broken. So we had our fair share of uh, major incidents. Ooh. Okay, um, business recovery plans. We keep it very simple at HSBC. You don't need an inch thick document to read at a time of disaster. You want to get going very, very quick. Um, there might be some people in the audience tonight who remember the 1960s and the space race between Russia and America. America spent $2 million building or making a biro which worked upside down in a weightless environment. The Russians <laughs> took a pencil. <laughs> I like the pencil approach. Um, once again, they must cover four main scenarios. Lots of buildings are what we normally concentrate on, and we've seen that tonight. Lots of systems. You can still use the systems that can be stolen. Your building's still intact. Have you got a plan for losing your systems? Hands up anybody who never has, has problems with their systems at all. They never go down. Okay? So you've got the startings of a plan there. You know, if that was two hours, four hours, eight hours, two days, what would you do? Um, lots of people. Well, I mentioned the pandemic flu. Um, it might be you've got a coach out into South End and something happens. You know, what would you do? How would your business recover from losing people? And again, back to this, critical supplies. And also internal dependencies. You could be a department who has a critical role to play. You've got a business recovery plan that recovers within eight hours. You might depend upon another department. You wouldn't want them going home for a week. So you've got to make sure that all your internal dependencies are up and running with you as well. Okay, um, the way we do it, or the way I do it, 
is we have two sections in our business recovery plan. Section one is the get up and go document. An incident that happens, you pick this up and you, and you start. And in section one, you have checklists. Um, what would you do if you lost your buildings out of hours? Who would you call? Would you call your contingency site? Would you call the police? And so on. What would you do if you lost the buildings in hours? You start with evacuation. How would you contact the staff? Would they know where to go? And, and so on. Um, and then normally we have another checklist which says, OK, we covered the first few hours of a disaster. In our case, we would now arrive at our contingency site. What, what do we do when we get there? Um, loss of people. What happens if you lose your people? It might not coincide with loss of buildings, as I mentioned. You know, do you have preferred um, agencies who provide staff? Do you have ex-staff who work somewhere else? Do you have retired staff? Do you have procedures which tell newcomers what to do? Um, loss of systems. Already mentioned that. I so say you can build upon your existing knowledge of what you do when you go down. And again this, what happens if your critical suppliers fail? Do you have a plan to get supplies from somewhere else? Do you check that they've got contingency plans? It's no good outsourcing work and thinking that's it. Okay, also in BRP section one, you had your checklist, this is what you do, tick, tick, tick. Now you need to contact your staff. Names of staff listed with telephone numbers, home number, work number, mobile numbers. Um, if you've got many staff, then you have to have a cascade system and identify to key people to call out other people. Once you list your staff on that spreadsheet, you can then tick off against it. Are these people going to a contingency site? Are they, are they important people? Do they have perhaps remote access or laptops? You know, just put a marker against their name on that sheet. You could also put on there, are they trained in first aid? Quite important at this time. Um, are they a, a marshal, fire marshal? You know, might be useful. Um, you then move on to other, other internal contacts. Who else do you need within your organisation to contact? What are uh, mobile numbers, home numbers and so on? And of course, most important as well, your external contacts. Who are your key customers, suppliers? You might need to contact them very early on, give them a new telephone number to ring. So this is a, a contact section. Work priorities. Um, you might think, well, we know our work priorities. We know what's important. If we get to our contingency site or if we recover you know, two days later, we know our priorities. But if you don't quite make it, you know, you die and somebody else takes over, you know, or you're in a state of trauma and you think, oh, what are my priorities? A simple list is all you need. Um, and from our experience, when we lost the Bishopsgate building, we had um, a department there called um, Payroll. They didn't have a business recovery plan. We thought it was internal payroll, and internal payroll isn't the highest priority. We could pay staff what they earned the previous month, if necessary. So we put them to the bottom of the list and started recovering in other areas. Um, that, that bomb happened um, Saturday morning at about 11 o'clock. So over the weekend, we were recovering. Come Monday morning, we managed to find somebody who worked for payroll, um, and they said, by the way, we've got external customers. We do payrolls for external customers. We didn't know that. If they'd had a BRP with priorities and what they did, anybody picking that up would know. Simple. Um, but those work priorities, there's no harm in listing everything you do in a priority order, because the contingency might be a major one, where you can only do a couple of bits, it could be a smaller contingency, and you've got the run of people, buildings elsewhere to use. You can do the whole lot in a certain order. Then, if you're you know, a, a slightly bigger company, you might want to list down your contingency requirements. <coughs> How many PCs do you need to get up and running when you get to your contingency site? Um, How many desks? How many phones? Um, photocopiers? Um, all these sort of requirements. Um, even if you don't have a contingency site, if you've got these listed, when you go out and buy a new property, you can concentrate on getting these key things up and running first. 
And if you do have a contingency site, then yeah, document it in your business recovery plan, put the address down, put a map in there so you know where you're going. <laughs> or somebody else who picks it up if you're not around. So, so that's section one. It's the checklist, the contacts, priorities, contingency requirements and site. Those, they are the things you need at the time of disaster. Um, in our section two, we should keep a, a separate document altogether. <coughs> you know, what does the department do? It's just an overview, half a page. Again, in case somebody else has to pick this up and understand what the department does. Um, in this section, we tend to put more information in about our key systems, listing all the key IT systems, listing all the key suppliers and internal dependencies. Then we can have a tick box to say, yes, they got contingency, yes, they got contingency. Yes, we might have a plan if that supplier goes to the wall. If that supplier goes to the wall, its contingency plan isn't going to work. So, you know, we try to have a plan um, if we lost, for example, our um, company that provides checks, we can go to somebody else. Also in section two, circulation list. Who has copies of this plan? Um, who approves it? Diarised updates, and I've put diarised in there because no could just put in your plan, I will update this in six months' time. Put it in your computer diary so it pops up in six months' time. Update your plan. Simple. Um, testing. You can have, have whole realms of separate testing documents. We tend to keep at the back of this section, in the admin section, when it was last tested, what issues arose, have they been sorted. Uh, a bit more about testing um, in a minute. And at the end of section two, we have a, another checklist. This is a, a control review checklist, so somebody can pick this up and say, does our BRP, does our plan cover all these points? And that's the sort of thing we have. Now, anybody can use this, the plan writer, the department head, audit, you know, and it doesn't really matter what format the plan is in, but I think if all those points are covered, um, you're there. Um, has the plan been reviewed annually? Uh, more regular updating for contacts lists. Are the checklists realistic? Um, have all staff and contacts been identified? Is a cascade system in place? And if there is, test it. You know, ring people up during the day at the weekend. See how far the cascade system works. I'm, I'm trying to think of a message we can put out in, internally on a cascade, which acts as a learning thing as well. You know, so that when it gets to everybody, everybody's learnt from the message we've actually cascaded out. Um, number five, have staff been issued with a major incident card? More about this later, but you know, a credit size card with key information on. So when you are at a police cordon, when you're on your way into work, you can't get to your business area, you've got a card to tell you what to do next. Oh, sorry. Um, number six, are you the type of business that must allocate contingency spaces to staff immediately? They go straight to the contingency site. Not many probably need to. You could send them home and contact them and say, you, you and you go to a certain place. But put that in your plan. Have, number seven, have you looked at all possible contingency arrangements? You don't need to buy or rent contingency space permanently. You could have an arrangement with a sister company. Why not a friendly supplier? Maybe part of the contract. If in the unlikely event we need a room, could you supply it? They'd probably say yes. They probably wouldn't charge you for it in the contract because once in the blue moon, you might need to go there. Why not? It's added value to the contract. Um, or you could go out and spend money to a third party contingency space provider and there's many around. You can actually um, rent space, it's syndicated um, so you may share it with other people but there are third party suppliers who sole business is contingency space. Um, if you're doing that then you want to make sure that you're really ruthless in what your critical requirements are because it will cost you money. Um, again, back to the third-party suppliers. <coughs> back to testing the BRP again. 
You can't get away from that. Are the test types relevant to the department? If you've got contingency space, it must be important. Therefore, you go to the contingency site and test it. The thing everybody must do is a desktop work for exercise. Because some of these things in the plan, the telephone numbers, the priorities <coughs> and so on, you know, they're not really tested if you go to your contingency site. Think of the scenario at the front of the presentation. Work through that with your department. Will your plan work? Um, any issues in testing? Are they reflected in the plan? Have they been updated? Have enough people been copied with the plan? And this last one is interesting. You, you've written the plan. You put it to one side. Hopefully, no longer than a year. Somebody else comes and picks it up to update it. If you can think of any changes coming up in the next 12 months that might have <coughs> impacted your plan, why not dot them down at the end of your plan? So somebody else picking this up and think, oh, did we introduce a new IT system? Did we double our size? You know, we've got a plan for it. But that's a, a straightforward checklist anybody can use. Okay. Um, lessons learned from our disasters. I always say there's three primary lessons from any disaster, any incident. That's communication, communication, <laughs> and communication. Um, you need to communicate to your staff, to your customers, suppliers, to your bosses, to the media perhaps, and then you need to start all over again in two hours' time and provide an update. Um, and we, we can all see what happens on the TV when it's a major incident. You know, you, you only know what's going on because Sky are there with a helicopter. And the police really, in many cases, know what's going on when the Sky helicopter turns up. But they, they'd be very, very quick. They'd be there on site. Um, it's no good fobbing them off with some simple explanation because they come back in again and again and again. Given something definite, you're recovering your business, it'd be business as usual very shortly, you know, we're contacting our staff, you know, and, and, and so on. But communication is key. Your telephones are more important than your PCs at this point in time. Clear desk policy. We've had papers float, blown out of windows at time of bombs. Um, in our Docklands bomb, um, we had security in our building that was destroyed. They were working on a, a multi-million pound case. Fortunately, they put all their papers away in a cupboard when they left um, to go home on a Friday night. You know, it was still there afterwards, albeit the cupboard had fallen over. Police cordons can prevent access for several days. It's no good use saying all, all our important documents are in the fireproof safe in the basement. They can be in a nuclear bombproof safe but the police won't let you get through the cordon for five days, maybe. There's a scene of crime, and it might be dangerous to access the building. Um, so bear that in mind. Incident log. Um, easy to forget. Time flies past. Um, when we had the Hemel Hempstead uh, fire, I kept a log of all the phone calls I made and received that morning. There was 50 phone calls at home, and my, mo my mobile phone was ringing. I was using my BlackBerry for a loudspeaker phone and, and outgoing phone, phone calls on the house phone. My wife loved it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, an incident log, timed. And it's useful to share that with other people, share with colleagues. This is what I did. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. But also a, an event of the day. How about this one? Um, you're in a building. It's, you've got shift workers, perhaps. There's been an evacuation, an incident. You, know, you haven't got senior management on site. What do they do? Uh, why not have an emergency box held in the reception, taken out whenever there's a fire drill, so it becomes automatic. Okay? You can't guarantee that in the big explosion that box will be taken out, but for 99% of <coughs> incidents, it will be. Um, contents, local emergency numbers, hospital numbers maybe evacuation procedures, maybe your, your, your incident manuals and key contact numbers to security and so on, maybe copies of your business recovery plans, maybe 
structure chart, shift rotors, yeah, A4 pads, pencils, <coughs> torches, yeah, nighttime, clipboards. That's an interesting one. Floor plans to show whereabouts of critical equipment, cupboards, and so on. Yeah. We all think about recovering from nothing, and that's really what you've got to plan for. But all the disasters I've seen, we say, oh, we must get that cupboard out of there. We must get that PC out of that building. And if you can give a contractor, once it's safe, a floor plan to go in to that corner of the room, X marks the spot, get that cupboard out. Yeah, silver foil blankets, radio, first aid <coughs> box, local hotel details, and quite important, hard hats, fluorescent jackets, safety gloves. If you are going to get through the cordon early on, there's more chance of getting through that cordon with that sort of equipment. Uh, and and we, have, we have done this. Carrying on. OK, a pocket-sized major incident card. This is the sort of thing I'm, I'm talking about. You can have lots of detail on here, little detail. We have a staff emergency telephone number on here. So people can ring this and get instruction. Um, when we go to 7-7, Many companies are saying we could not communicate with our staff. Mobile networks are up and down. We didn't know where they were and so on. This worked because if you can get to a landline and ring this number, we can get a message line to tell them some high-level instructions. Um, what to do. The first message might just be a holding message because we know something's happened. We don't know what it is. But we will say on that holding message, ring back in one hour, and then we can update it. Um, on the other side... We can say, um, where's your contingency site? Where's your, do you, or do you go home? You know, a good instruction is go home, stay by your telephone during normal working hours. What's wrong with that? At least you know where they are. Um, you might be the sort of business where you want to collect some of your staff together. Um, and I think this might come up in a minute. Um, yeah, there we are. Three minutes, minutes okay. We need it there. Pre-agreed meeting place, half a mile away. So if you're a critical business and you need to recover quickly, get your staff to a pre-agreed meeting place. Might be a hotel. that take you in. Open up the bar. You know, great. <coughs> or, or another branch or another a customer or supplier. Have a reciprocal arrangement with them. Why not? <coughs> your mobile phones. They might not work in a disaster, but you've got a directory of telephone numbers there you can use. If you're part of a cascade system and you've got 10 people to ring, why not enter those numbers under CAS? So they're all there in one point in your phone. Did I? Oh, I think I covered that one. Well, I got it wrong earlier anyway, but it's, um, it's that one. Don't forget the loss of justice, insurance. Photograph some video if you can once you can get into the building. And, you know. This is what we're talking about tonight, liaise with the local authorities, emergency services. And hopefully, I'd like to think at some time in the future, we'll get a nice plan of Southwark saying, if something happened here, this would be the police cordon. I imagine one of the cordons would be the River Thames, natural, natural cordon. The UK resilience teams have the M25 as a cordon if there's a major incident in London with plans to shut down certain lanes for getting supplies in and injuries out. You know, it, it's that bigger business that we're talking about. Get BT to divert your phones to an external number. It's no good putting a message on your internal system, that's gone. But you can have a system with BT, you ring them up outside your business, give a password, they switch all your incoming calls to record an announcement, which you can control. Computer backups held off-site and tested by IT. Hold them off-site, but get them tested. Make sure they work. You know, back up this in a friend's house if necessary. The walkthrough scenario, very important. Think of the one at the start of the presentation. Undertake testing at the contingency site. And don't forget about stress. People will be stressed by this, even if they come back from holiday and see that building raised to the ground. That could affect them. You'd also get people working 24-7 to recover. Send them home after 18 hours so they can come back refreshed in six hours, or two hours. 
Um, and just put a point in there, you know, this is what it's all about tonight, taking action to avoid these things. Um, the police probably won't like me saying this, but if you're a small company, why not put a dummy camera in or a sign-up? Why not, um, if you've got an open reception area and a reception desk and people just stroll in, why not put a, a roped barrier across to guide them towards the desk? Simple. You can see them if they jump over the rope and they guide them towards the desk. And really, you know, they will go for the soft target. So if half of you go away tonight and install CCTV, the other half will be um, hit by crime next week. <laughs> but, you know, they will go for the soft target. Um, okay. So <coughs> bear in mind, lessons are not learned until they're put into practice. These are only learning opportunities to go away with, or opportunities for you. And just to finish off, that's a very useful website, londonprepared.gov.uk. That would give you all the links you need to business continuity, police sites, and also provide information at the time of a disaster. You know, for instance, 7-7, seven, seven, you know, the riverboats are free, taking people out of London. You know, fuel crisis, that would appear on there as well. Very useful website with all the links you need to, you know, as you know, thousands of other websites. Okay, any questions? <laughs>